graceandtruthradio.world proudly presents Life Coaching for Men, Improving Their Relationships with Their Wives and Learning to Communicate for a More Fulfilling and Satisfying Marriage. And now, Men Loving Well with Christian Counselor, Author, and Relationship Coach, Dr. Jim Slaughter. Dr. Jim Slaughter is our guest today. He is a life coach who works with men all over the world to live their dream. Welcome today, Dr. Slaughter. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm excited about what you're doing these days. I definitely changed my schedule around a little bit to have you on because uh, we had a CEO businessman on last week. And he talked about that he was so successful, but yet he still felt empty in his life and pursued life coaching to right. change his life. And he really did that. So he, now he's living his dream. Yes, he is. And I had so many emails from people wanting to know about what exactly life coaching was and how was it different from counseling. And so I had 91 emails exactly wow. <laughs> asking okay. all these questions. So I decided instead, since you are a specialist, a life coach that works directly with men, to have you on. So we are going to start, but let me let people know a little bit about your background. You have done so much, it's quite vast. <laughs> In school? You were a zoologist major and chemistry. Mm -hmm. That's right. I was very interested in sciences early in my life. And uh, even as a kid, I, I, I kind of wanted to dig up dinosaur bones. I wanted to be an archaeologist. I didn't know it was really a paleontologist yeah. that I wanted to be. But never got to do that. But I, I, I did opt for a, uh, a major direction in my undergraduate work in the sciences. I was thinking I might enter a medical career. After you got out of college, you went into the Air Force, and you were an officer. Yeah, I did. And you trained combat air crews. Yes, I did. Uh, my job specifically with the combat air crews in those days was to help them come out alive if their uh, aircraft became disabled or if they had a crisis aboard the aircraft. And so it had to do with the use of life support equipment and uh, things like oxygen systems, ejection seats, what to do basically in, in a crisis situation. So when this plane starts spinning, that, uh, would be that would be a part of what I helped them understand to ha how to get out of. Some people, some of those flight crews said we tortured them. We had a uh, what was called a decompression chamber that we would have them in, and we could simulate a high altitude pressure situation. So we could simulate having them at thirty five thousand feet or forty three thousand feet or something like that, and then we could take their oxygen away and That's see what, what they would do. I was <laughs> right, wondering right, if you did right. that. And we <laughs> yeah, and we would teach them what to do if there are if a system failed. Uh, we would teach them to know symptoms of hypoxia, which is oxygen deficiency, and what to do if that happened and things like that. Ejection seats, parachutes, all that. Then you left the Air Force eventually and you went into ministry. Uh, you went with Campus Crusade for Christ. Right, that actually a little bit before the Air Force experience, but then after the Air Force, I entered graduate school and earning my master's degree, then went to California, pastored a church for a number of years there. Wow. Then you went back to grad school to get your doctorate. I did. I went back, uh, applied for uh, PhD studies and went back and, and was invited to take a uh, a faculty position, uh, which I did, and and was there a long time. So, what happened to you from the Air Force to go to going into ministry and becoming a pastor? Because there's quite a switch there. Something happened to me that had to do with the spiritual side of me, and uh, and that really caused me to rethink my life direction, where I wanted to go, and and what I think, what I thought I needed to do or wanted to do with my life. And so, uh, at that time, I I ended up. Um, really trusting Christ with my, my eternal salvation, my destiny. And uh, it really wanted, made me want to uh, investigate a little bit more thoroughly the claims of Christ and uh, spiritual issues in, in a person's life and got me really interested in ministry. And so um, that's when I went on staff with Campus Crusade for Christ for a while, worked on some campuses in Indiana, uh, Indiana University, Notre Dame, Ball State, Purdue, some of those those schools. And that was that was interesting. Okay, yeah, you did investigate the claims of Christ quite a bit. Yeah, I did. All the way through master's and doctorate. And <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. kept going. Yeah, I really did. Right, right. <laughs> well, now, I, I know most of what you do as a life coach. I have mm -hmm. to kid around, though. I know you're also a rancher and a viticulturist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those came really late to me in my life, and uh, they, they've provided a lot of color for me, you know. But, yeah, when I was a professor, I loved that. I just loved being in students' lives. And, and these were committed, motivated students. They were at the grad level. I taught 
you know, doctoral seminars and, and master's level courses and things like that. And I, uh, I, I wanted to make the material as practical as possible and really get involved in students' lives. They would come to me. I'd meet with small groups in the morning and help a number of them uh, find contacts for positions in ministry later when they uh, got to that point and so really loved it. You help men all over the world live their dreams. Right. Uh, yes, yes, I do, actually. So you must do that by phone, mostly. I do it by phone, uh, and guys like that a lot because it's a lot more flexible for them. My question for you is, what are their dreams? What are these men's dreams, exactly, that you help them? Achieve? Yeah, that's a good question. We were talking about this a little bit earlier, and I, you know, when I think, I, I tend to think more technically. You know, I, I, men come to me for different reasons. Uh, sometimes it's career-oriented. In fact, often with men, it is career-oriented. <laughs> They're wanting to uh, climb up the ladder in their career, maybe. They're wanting a higher position. They're wanting more pay. Maybe they want to change careers. Sometimes it's that. Sometimes it has to do with the relationships. In fact, uh, probably more relationships than, than career orientation. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because I think that men often will hire a life coach for career things as well. But it ends up that what they're pursuing in their career to find that love and self-esteem and whatever that is, that affirmation they need so badly, is because their life at home isn't where they can get that. So they almost over-pursue it in their career. No, that's exactly right. The the reason we become workaholics or, or we spend too much time at the office is because our our family life or our married marriage uh, is not satisfying. We're not content there, and so we just move in a different direction. The interesting thing is that when people come for coaching, they discover that what really blossoms is uh, is their own self in the process of all of that. So that that contentment at home begins to come to them. They enjoy those relationships better. They get more affirmation in that context than they did before, and so they enjoy that more. That is why I think everyone says... See Dr. Slaughter for coaching, and they tell a lot of women that have to have their men see, have their husbands see you, <laughs> or men if they're having problems in their marriage. Just to think about living a dream and to, and to really define that is hard. But living your dream usually means your whole life being the way you want it, everything being so fulfilling and so content. And I know that this is where you get these men, you take them on this journey to be able to live the life that you have realized over time, that you have found this truly wonderful dream that you live. And so I know you're writing a book on that, and I'm not going to say anything about that because you're not ready to do that yet. But you have a reputation with men to really bring them to their lifelong dream. Yeah, I think most people have given up on their dreams. I, you know, I talk to men about their dream, and, and I do work mostly with men. I just feel like I do, I'm able to help them a, a lot, and, and there are plenty of men out there to focus on and, and work with. And I think that uh, when I share some things with them and I talk to them, sometimes they are just fascinated because the what I'm talking about is something they either gave up on a long time ago or they never got to. I, I ask men what they do for fun, and they tell me they haven't had fun since they were 12. And that's sad. It's a part of their dream, you know. And so I, I help them rethink their life really in those ways and begin having some fun and, and moving, you know, identifying and moving towards what their dreams really are. When I think of men going to work and coming home, trying to have balance, uh, do well at work and do well with their family, they tend to be living the life their wife wants them to live in a way once they get home. That's their free time. And if they do that, they'll, they'll die a little bit inside. Mm-hmm. And so how does a man who, <clears throat> I see when they're younger, blowing up things and stuff like that. <laughs> you watch the boys together. How do they continue truly being themselves and finding such joy and happiness and balance? Because Tommy Kirby last week, when he talked, he is incredibly more successful than he was before once he got his personal life in order. Right. When he came, I mean, he was clearly saying he was miserable when he came. Mm-hmm. And he knew so much of it was his personal life. And he is one of the few men that when they come, they actually know that, that they're already reaching this pinnacle of success. And they are to the point where they realize that it's their personal life that's lacking. And they have tried, and with all their skills, to be able to... Yeah, they've worked and worked and worked and just <laughs> can't get there from here. And and uh, they have good skills, they have good knowledge, good experience, good training, but they just can't do it. And that's why they seek a life coach. They're motivated. They want it to happen. They aren't in crisis particularly, except they just want something better. They want a better life. They want to achieve some goals, fulfill their dreams. They don't know how to do it. And so that's why they have a life coach. They get a life coach. 
Mm-hmm. And, and I think motivated is an important word. Very important. Yes. And coaching, you need to be motivated. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's why, you know, you got to be in a lot of pain or something has to move you to say, I don't want to live like this anymore. Yeah, you just have to get to the place where you say, you know what, I'm tired of this. Uh, it's okay, but I don't want okay. I want great. I want the best. And uh, so a person's motivated to do it. In fact, I give a pre-coaching assessment to every person who asks me to coach them. So I know exactly where they are. I know if they're motivated or not. If they're not, then I say, you know what, maybe we should, let's do some things before we actually would start coaching. Let's get you to a place where you're ready to do that. Or I may say, you are ready. You know, let's go for it. So Well, and when you say that, that you may say, let's do some things first. That is what you mean by giving them options. Um, Counseling could be one of them. Yeah, it could be counseling uh, uh, or it might be just just uh, uh, maybe a, a group process of some kind you know, right. where they can get to hear from other men. Or even like life enrichment and retreat. Yeah, there, there are absolutely. certain things. So we have a lot of other things available because I think it's important that people know that coaching coaching is people who are doing okay. I mean, it's not people who are in deep, deep, deep pain, struggling, that are, you know, that have a, um, a crisis in their yeah, life. Yeah, they're not in crisis. They don't have a mental, they haven't been diagnosed with a mental health disorder. They're just, they're in a better, a little bit better place. Than that. Now, when you say that, mm-hmm. you know, because there are chronic disorders that you live with. And yeah, that's true. That's especially true. nowadays, almost everyone could have something. But you mean <laughs> where you're able to function fine, you're functional. Yeah, you're where fine. you, yeah where, yeah, where you're not in a dysfunctional state of some right. kind and you can think clearly, you or in touch with your feelings to sure. a certain extent, that kind of thing. And mostly willing to work. Yeah, very mostly motivated to work, right? Well, And that is what is um, why you call yourself a coach. Exactly. And, and we were talking, again, about this earlier, and, and I was thinking, in fact, Ann asked me, why, why are you called a coach? I'm an advocate for people who come to me for help. I am behind them. I inspire them. I, I make them believe in themselves. I do the kinds of things that coaches do on the field. I think the motivation that you just mentioned is so important because mm-hmm. my coaches, they weren't mean, they weren't demeaning, they didn't right. scare me. They motivated me through affir- affirming me and challenging me and believing in me. And and I believe that the way that they talked to me, they made me believe I could be the best. Right. I could be the absolute best gymnast, the absolute best in karate, the absolute best I was drawn to them and entrusted them because of the way that they believed in me. And, uh, you know, I wanted to say research has shown that uh, intimidation only motivates people for a very, very short period of time. And then it falls off and they become very uninspired and unmotivated. And so that's a good coach has to be like the one you're talking about. But you help them win, and you did say that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and, and so a coach does that. They they look for little bitty things that might need to be tweaked a little bit, or some correction. You know, hold your get your elbow up higher, shorten your stance, uh, make sure your eyes are on the ball. You know that kind right. of thing, and keep them. There. And so a coach and I would work with a person in, in a very similar way. Look at this. Have you seen this? You know, let's tweak that a little bit. And by doing that over time and, and having some skills. And see, I, I have them develop skills just like coach on the field would have his players develop skills. There are disciplines I take them through. There's a, there's a series of things that they begin to do to develop skills that they'll have the rest of their lives. It's not just for this period of time. It's forever. And that's the conditioning you're talking right, about. Right, absolutely. There's a conditioning process that life coaches are a good one will take their clients through that get them to the point where they this is something that becomes a part of their lifestyle right. and they know how to do it just like a good athlete becomes a better athlete through the conditioning process and that's the difference even in football you can tell people who get hurt a lot are probably not conditioning as well as the ones that don't get hurt a lot i think that's exactly right and I know you, that the conditioning is one of the most important parts to you. Yeah, absolutely it is. It's one of the things that made a difference for me in my own life. And, you know, I mean, I just say I went through life coaching myself, and it changed my life for the better. And, and it, it, it gave me something to grab onto, to pass on to other men, and I really, really am glad about that. I also wanted to say, though, when it comes to holding people accountable in the life coaching process, you, you don't do it through intimidation or domination. You, I do it by asking good questions. You know, what, what, do, you think, what, what do you think kept you from, uh, from writing as much this week? What was, it, was holding you back? And so you ask the life coach's best friend is a great question to ask. 
So you don't go, oh my gosh, you didn't, you only did five times. No, no right. Yeah, <laughs> gu guilt and shame, though, that, that, they they, you're trying to get away from that, right. uh, not, not use that as a technique, for so sure. You, so you challenge them to grow. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you challenge them to become and do more than they think they possibly can. Yeah, and that doesn't mean I don't push them and pull them and stretch them and, you know, point out things <laughs> that they can do better and all that. You do that. It's just, uh, yeah, that's, that, the that's a part of it. Part. Yeah, that's the yeah. uncomfortable part. I right. think even, I have to ask you about, men in general because um if you're working with them on how to get their needs met with women that tells me <laughs> that they and i have to i know women are difficult okay i know we're strange and we're difficult we think you guys are difficult uh they must not understand women oh i think that's definitely true we do not understand you guys we really don't and we think in such different ways and uh i mean again going back to to the research picture that has demonstrated that uh there was a book some time back called brain sex the real difference between men and women and that that was really a a highlighting thing for this men tend to think compartmentally and we think linearly women tend to think comprehensively so they're they're thinking of everything that comes into play we also tend to think in terms of what you do rather than who you are. And that's a big difference in the way men and women think. If a man was getting flowers for his wife mm -hmm. and you were very, you you knew that her love language was not gifts. Right. Okay. Uh, you knew where to direct them correctly uh, to help them see that they're, what they're trying to do is not going to work. Yeah, and, and men get frustrated by that because they, they think that what they like is something that their wife should like too, right? right? And so they do that, and their wife doesn't care about that at all. <laughs> and they the men can't figure out why their wives are not appreciating that. When the truth is the husband hasn't figured out uh, what it is that uh, makes the wife feel loved. For you, you said life coaching changed your life. Yeah, it did. Okay. How would you say for you as far as women and what you've learned about teaching these men, how, how did life coaching help you with that? Well, I, I think for one thing, it let me look inside myself a little bit, see how I had been approaching life overall over and against uh, what might make me more successful in all of my relationships. I think it made me realize that there was a, a greater need for some humility in my life. Sometimes professors and PhD type guys are not well known for that. And there's a reason for that, but more humility and, and that helps in all relationships, more transparency, more honesty and openness, being more forthcoming. Those are things that life coaching teaches a person. And those are honestly some powerful things that work in your favor in relationships. It's hard to fake it, though, and so uh, it's a process of learning to become people like that, men like that. That's one of the ways, by the way, and becoming like that, it's one of the ways that we get our wives to do what we want them to do or to give us what we want. I like the way that you well, rephrase that. Yeah, right. Oh, okay. <laughs> Humility, it is very important for women to see that in a man. And, and honesty and transparency as well, I think. Right, openness, yeah. and I think that's hard. Uh, we expect so much out of a man. We want them to be strong and we want them to be confident. We want them to be smart. We want them to be gentle. Okay. Right, right. And we want them confident but humble. And It's kind of uh, contradictory. It soft sounds, but it? strong. And right, I know. It, it is a hard balance. So men do have a hard job when it comes to their family. I think humility, transparency, not hiding, lying. I think most men don't lie. They omit um, and cover. Yeah. And cover, mm -hmm. yes. And so those are those are really important things. And so you went through that and you learned that because you're a, you've are you been a very successful man. And you've spoken in places that <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily want to go. Just, you went to Colombia. I know. And it was Russia. really bad to go there. <laughs> I know. It's funny. But, uh, you, you know, uh, you've gone to like Holland and, and France. France and all those neat <laughs> all those places. sweet places, you know, yes. I'm going to places where it, you're lucky to get out. Yeah, they have know? machine guns. <laughs> I know, right? right? You've just been a uh, led a really incredible life there was a point where you came to learn these things yeah and what men don't understand is i mean you know they have some things uh, maybe there's dissatisfaction or there's you know discontent in their marriage relationship and they want certain things that perhaps they're they're not getting or feel like they're not getting from their wives but they they don't understand uh, the way to, to to get that and they don't understand that getting really starts with giving and so sometimes just alerting men to some very simple things can change the picture in big ways for them. I could see that. I, I could truly see that. And I know you've done this. I know that even though you see men, and most of the time, 
you've done incredible with women when you get them because women don't understand men. Right. They don't. And they come to you with that mainly, honestly, their, their needs not being met. They're, right. they're deep. Their love tank is empty. They don't know how to get their husband to meet their needs or make them feel more loved. A lot right. of times they won't have felt loved. Right. That's true. Uh, and so whatever it is they say, like they, they aren't being helped or their husband doesn't spend time with them or, or whatever it is. Okay. You can easily help them get to the place where they change the way that they're trying to get their needs met by their husband. Because it's not working. Mm -hmm. And it does take people a long time to come in because they've tried everything for a long time. Yeah, we usually do that. We we try uh, in uh, with every resource we, we can think we have, you know, every skill, every uh, talent or ability, and it doesn't work. And right. so that's usually what brings us in when we're, we're motivated to, to find some way to do this. So let's say that for you, um, you have a, a man come in. And um, he isn't satisfied with his life. Mm -hmm. And I know you've had different men do that. And I know you've even had students do that. You had a lady from Columbia or uh, Carnegie oh, Mellon. Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon, Mellon University, yeah. Yeah, grad student there uh -huh. that you helped her. Right. Um, and she went into the business of working with companies. Yeah, and um, she she her biggest uh, issue was motivation. She could not get motivated to get out there and use her skills. And uh, you know, by the time we were through with the coaching process, she was flying to California That's and right. getting out there, and she was meeting with these top executives, and she was showing her stuff, and and uh, and and getting hired by a really right. really big outfit, and uh, and just loved what she did. So right. that was neat, you know, to see. Uh, men that have hired you have been sat dissatisfied with their jobs. Often. And yes. often. often. Is that most often? No, no, not really. I, I think that the most consistent issue is relationship issues. You know, right. people come in and they, they and often it's marriage. Uh, sometimes it. As a life coach, you walk with them through these processes. You are all about them reaching their goal. So yeah. how does that work as a husband? Because I, I would say most men are not satisfied in their marriages. Most men. Well, I don't know what the statistics would be, but I, I suspect that's true. Why is that? Gosh, there's so many, there are different reasons for that. But you, usually it's because they really don't know how to be a good husband. So part of my responsibility is to help them understand relationally, and not, not just relationally, but what it means to be a good husband. And uh, what a woman needs from her husband, so you know. What what is that? <laughs> <laughs> Put me on the spot here, what don't you? <laughs> I, I think a woman needs from her husband compassion. Compassion. She needs to sense that he is really working on understanding what she wants, what she needs. He listens to her actively. He asks good questions. He's willing to say, "I am so sorry. I didn't even know I was doing that." She needs to see him in a, a unprotected profile. In other words, uh, out there, open, honest, not defending himself. We have such a tendency, guys, do to defend ourselves. We we don't like being wrong. We don't like making mistakes. For men, see it differently. We don't like to be there, and so it's very, very difficult. Wherever you see a guy who says, I am sorry, you are right, I did the wrong, I was wrong to do that. Right. You see a guy who's gone down the road a bit, you right. know, he's learned some things. I was laughing a little bit because you're so passionate about what well, you're Well, I am, I'm very, I am, I you're am, like, because I know what it's, see, and that's one of the differences uh, between the client and me. I know how he can change, and I know how to help him reach his goals. I see things he doesn't see. I help him correct the mistakes that he makes, okay? And we're not equal in that because he doesn't see any of that. Right. I see that. And I'm, I'm like a coach that says, your stance is too broad. Bring your feet in a little bit. Raise your elbow or you're dropping it or whatever. Come on, and, man. You can do this. <laughs> you can do this, right? And so we aren't equal in that way. I mean, he may be a better plumber or carpenter or executive than I am, okay? I got that. But, but I know more about this than he does, and so I can help him here. You also, because as a life coach, you've been trained how to pull these things out of them, these, these qualities that you know are in these men, right. to be excellent husbands. Because I would say that, of course, they don't know how to be good husbands. They don't have very good models. Right. And, and I think even if they had a, a great dad, 
because I know that my like even my um, executive producer here has a wonder. He he loves his dad. Mm-hmm. I love my dad. He's mm-hmm. this in fabulous dad. And no no fathers are perfect. They all make mistakes. Right. They had gone through the hard balance too of being successful, but not being successful in this area and all the things they've gone through. But I think most of what kids look at are the athletes and the models that are out there on TV. And they seem so exciting. Their life seems so exciting. And so they're looking out at other people outside of their family. But a lot of families, fathers struggle in some way. Sure. Every father struggles in different ways. And, you know, it's true. Familiarity breeds contempt. I mean, you know, you're you're around these people every single day. You yeah. see the, the smallest mistakes, you know, you right. see those things happen. And so it's harder, I think, for a dad to develop integrity. I think it's harder for a dad to develop a good reputation with his kids, yeah. you know, than it is for a football coach someplace, you know. Well, it's much harder, I think. I think work is uh, has a definition, and they have roles. They have defined roles of the jobs right. that they do. Most jobs, I'm not saying all jobs do, but you know, you have a um, an, an expectation absolutely de- defined for you. And a man just doesn't naturally know how to be a great father, or no, great, no, great husband, great husband. No, no, he doesn't know that. It's not instinctive for him. It is a learned skill. Okay, it's a learned skill with men. They have to learn how to do that, they, and, and it's step by step. Uh, you know, I have so many guys who come to see me and they say, you know, everything goes great at work. Every work is great. I'm doing great there, but I'm such a failure at home. What's wrong with me? And so we talk about that. That you, you mentioned the structure at work. I mean, and I said, well, you have a, a rules to go by at work, right? You have a structure to, to to fit into at work, right? Oh yeah, yeah. And if people don't do what you say, you fire them, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, you don't fire your wife, or you can't fire your kids, right? And so it's harder at home. There's not the same kind of structure, and so we learn how to deal with that. We learn how to to fit into what what family looks like, what home looks like. And it brings so much pleasure to have your home be your safe place. To not have that leaves you feeling so empty inside. Right, it does. And there's, in fact, that brings to mind a couple that I'm working with right now have been coming to see me. And that turnabout has taken place for them. There was a time when the dad was an outcast. But now he has, he's really shifted a lot of things in his life. He's gotten better. He really is healthy now. And his family has invited him back into the home, and they are so thrilled to have him. It's a new life for them. He is the leader. They look to him, and, they, and he has already built some integrity with them, which he had totally lost. I know for you, I've seen you and heard so much about what you do with these men to bring them such deep satisfaction and pleasure and success. In their personal life, home life, spiritual life, I mean, but they're still so successful. And I, and I think that's the key because I think their fear is they'll start working with someone and all these qualities, like I mentioned with Tommy, that their business would go down or their success would go down. No, no, it almost always goes up. It's always almost always up. the uh, the reverse of that, the inverse mm-hmm. of that. Yeah. They're more successful than before. Because if their home life is good. Then they're good. I mean, you know, that's that's the one area where they feel they feel failure. And if they can be content and see success in that and get the home life where they would like for it to be, and if they can realize dreams at home, then dreams at work just skyrocket. Thank you again for joining us. Men Loving Well airs live every Thursday at 1030 a.m. Central Time on graceandtruthradio.world. If you would like to contact or coach with Dr. Jim Slaughter, reach out to him on facebook.com. Living Wealth Show. Email him at jslaughterphd at yahoo.com or contact him at his clinic, Life Solutions, 817-232-1363. We look forward to seeing you again next week here on Men Loving Wealth.